We're going to read from Acts. Uh, We'll be looking at Acts this morning. Uh, We'll be reading from Acts chapter 2. We'll take it from verse 22, Acts 2 and verse 22. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus a Nazarene, a man tested, attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. This man delivered over for, by the predeterminate plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. For David says of him, I saw the Lord always in my presence, for he is at my right hand, so that I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue exalted. Moreover, my flesh also will live in hope, because you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You have made known to me the ways of life, You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. And so because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to sit one of his descendants on his throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ that he was neither abandoned to Hades nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you have both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. When they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent. And each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises for you and your children, and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words he solemnly testified, and kept on exalting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who received his word were baptized, and that day there was added about 3,000 souls. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' doctrine, and to fellowship, and to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Father, we thank you for this passage of scripture. We thank you for all that took place at Pentecost, but we thank you, Lord, that so much of the preaching of the early church centered around the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray, O God, that we might uh, perhaps understand in a new way all that was involved through the resurrection, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Just this week there's been a survey taken amongst uh, uh, so-called Christians, churchgoers, and uh, it seems quite a few uh, don't believe in the resurrection. Actually, one of the Queen's chaplains said that if they don't believe in the resurrection, they're not real Christians. So thank God for that. You may wonder on what basis he made that statement, but you remember in Romans it says very clearly that we need to confess with our lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, and then we shall be saved. So it is an essential part of true salvation. If we don't believe in the resurrection then we have to question whether we've been saved or not. Because after all, that same power, and uh, uh, Val uh, referred to it this morning in Romans 1, Jesus being raised from the dead by the Holy Spirit, 
that same power comes into our lives when we become believers in the Lord Jesus Christ to change our lives. And that same power is available as we've seen as we've been looking at Ephesians uh, 1, uh, the last, last house group. We see that that power is available for us as well. So if we're discounting the resurrection, we're seriously hindering, well, certainly our, our salvation in the first place and even our walk with the Lord later. But I thought it would be good just to look at uh, the Acts of the Apostles and see how uh, Paul and others, Peter here, uh, preached regarding the resurrection. Uh, because perhaps we get further insight into all that uh, is involved, although by no means will we have exhausted what has taken place through the resurrection or the meaning of the resurrection. Uh, we have to look at other scriptures as well. Not least that Jesus said he was the resurrection and the life. And those who believed him, in him would be raised up on the last day. So there is so much. But it seemed important to me that uh, those of us who preach the gospel should have a good look at how they preached the gospel in the first century. And see that the resurrection had played a far more prominent part uh, than we do when we preach the gospel. And perhaps that means that we need to uh, change our own approach. I suppose one of the things is that uh, we have uh, uh, come to believe in the resurrection uh, for uh, those who are preaching in the first century. It was something that uh, the world hadn't particularly heard of. And it was a crucial part because God was demonstrating something very clearly in the resurrection of Jesus. So let's have a closer look about the whole matter of the risen Lord and what it uh, should mean for us. The first thing you may notice in this passage, and uh, there's quite a bit about the resurrection here. The first thing is that it says in Acts 2 and verse 24 that it was impossible to be held by death. Uh, but God raised him up, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. I've often looked at that and wondered uh, just uh, what was uh, being conveyed there. Uh, it was impossible for Jesus to be held by death. Of course, I suppose we might say very quickly, well, Jesus has taken a human form, but he is God, and you cannot kill God, because God is immortal. So the psalmist said, from everlasting to everlasting, you're God, right through the ages, but before time and after time. He is God. He is an eternal being, not... Uh, like us, we're mortal beings. I think the other week I said, yeah, hey, we were immortal, but uh, that's not quite true. We're not yet. Uh, perhaps God wanted it to be the uh, case in the Garden of Gethsemane, and we mis Garden of Gethsemane, Garden of Eden, and we messed it all up uh, by, uh, or Adam did, Adam and Eve. But it was impossible to be held, and actually he does go on to say why it was impossible for him to be held by death. It's amazing, isn't it? You can read a statement like that and not see how the logic follows on or the argument is following on. And I have to confess that I hadn't really. And one of the things he goes on to say that it was impossible for Jesus to undergo decay. And the reason for that was that very clearly uh, David had prophesied that the Holy One would not see decay. So if that is a prophecy about the Messiah, and that was believed to be a prophecy about the Messiah, then it was impossible for death to hold him. Otherwise that prophecy would have been uh, uh, invalid. It would have been, pro would have been proved false. And so we know full well that Jesus was in the tomb, uh, but he did not see decay. Uh, I don't know how quick uh, decay sets in, but uh, no doubt God was uh, saving that from happening in any case. Because it does happen fairly quickly, the body begins to break down. But Jesus came alive on that, uh, on that third day. And, uh, you know, people may dispute it today, but as the Apostle Paul says, 500 people saw him at one time. And we have a record of all those resurrection appearances. Uh, so these are eyewitnesses. And uh, certainly... Uh, uh, I, it would seem to me all the Gospels were, well, per perhaps apart from uh, John, were all written before AD 70 with the destruction of the Temple because they all speak of it happening. So the Gospels were written fairly early on, we have to say. 
But here it is. Here's this uh, word of prophecy concerning the Messiah that he would not undergo decay. So therefore it was impossible for death to hold him. Secondly, uh, there is another word that David brought and it's uh, quoted there or in this passage. But it's uh, in Psalm 110. The Lord said, sit at my right hand till I put my, your enemies under uh, your feet. And uh, David uh, very clearly was speaking about the Messiah. And you may remember that Jesus used that very passage. And he said, look, how, how can uh, David talk about Messiah being his Lord when Messiah is actually a son of David? And it was quite a conundrum for them. Of course, really, we know the answer. That Jesus was already in existence beforehand, sitting at the right hand of God. Uh, but equally that he would take a human form uh, and uh, be a descendant of David after the flesh. But equally he would again take that seat at the right hand of God. So uh, he's talking very much here about uh, being exalted to the right hand of God in verse 33. Therefore having been exalted to the right hand of God... And having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both hear, uh, see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. So there it is. There's another prophecy concerning Messiah, that he would sit at the right hand of God. And of course we know that Jesus ascended to heaven. The writer to the Hebrews talks about Jesus having made purification for sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So again it was impossible for death to hold him. Otherwise that prophecy would have been null and void. And then he goes on to say, Because of these things, therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Messiah. I prefer that word to, uh, I wish we had always translate it Messiah rather than Christ. Uh, we use the word Christ, uh, for it becomes from Christos, which means anointed one. Mashiach is the Hebrew uh, for anointed one. And of course, there's so much more involved. We tend to think of Jesus Christ as just being his surname. Uh, and we forget it means anointed one, or the Messiah, the promised one that all the Jews were looking for. Because God's word was showing one special one would come. And we thought something of that last Sunday, uh, Sunday morning. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The coming one. So he is Lord and Messiah. God has made him Lord and Messiah. By this very act of raising him from the dead. And causing him to be seated at that right hand. God is saying he is Lord. He's reigning. But he's Messiah. All that was promised concerning Messiah has been fulfilled in his resurrection. So this is a very powerful argument uh, that comes through here concerning the risen Lord. Of course, when uh, Peter declares God has made him Lord and Messiah, they begin to have their consciences pricked because many of them would have been crying out away with him, crucify him. And perhaps some of the priests were even amongst that crowd on the day of Pentecost as they saw that uh, again a miraculous event because people were speaking in unknown languages and, uh, and yet people were recognizing their language as they gave uh, praise to God. They heard uh, them speaking the great things that God had done in their various languages. Well, we're not looking at that particularly this morning. We might do on uh, Pentecost Sunday. But uh, so no doubt a crowd had gathered to find out what was happening. And maybe some of those skeptics, maybe some of those even been crying to, uh, to do away with Jesus and crucify him just a few days earlier. But now they're cut to the quick. They're, their consciences are pricked as they hear that God has made him Lord and Messiah by the resurrection. And so they say, what shall we do? And he says, repent and be baptized. Of course, that's always to be the response to the gospel, to the good news. That we do need to turn around and go God's way. Amen. And uh, begin that new life by the power of the Holy Spirit. So this is the day of Pentecost. That's just one of those messages that we find here in the Acts of the Apostles. 
And then if we turn to Acts chapter 5, you find again that uh, much the same is being said. Uh, that uh, he is exalted. But in Acts 5 and verse 30, it says, The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you had put to death by hanging him on a cross. He is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as prince and a saviour to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey. Now when it says, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, we're not sure whether it actually means raised up from the dead there, or raised up a a, a saviour, raised up the Messiah. Because uh, the, the Greek word can mean either. Uh, But obviously it goes on to talk about uh, the death of Jesus. But uh, God has exalted him to his right hand. So that implies again resurrection. He was not left in the tomb. He was raised from the dead and is now seated at the right hand of God. So it's showing that this person whom the Jews had largely rejected is an extremely important person because he's now at the right hand of God. Nobody else is seated there. He is, of course, part of the Godhead and reigns with the Father. But he is exalted, it says here, as Prince and Saviour or Ruler and Saviour. So two things are coming through. That this one rules on high, along with the Father, but he's Saviour of the world as well. Of course, as ruler, we are reminded that he came to bring the kingdom, bring in the kingdom of God. To establish the reign of God in our lives. And that's one reason why we need to repent. Because before we become Christians, we're just going our own way. But if God is bringing in his kingdom and his reign, then we need to submit to the, the, the ruler. To the one who is the king. They cried out uh, when Jesus was about to be crucified away with him. We will not have this man to rule over us. To reign over us. When we become Christians we say we will have this man to reign over us. He is God. But equally we say he's saviour. He's the only person who could save us from the penalty of sin. And I would say the power of sin. So many lives have been turned around when they come to faith in Jesus Christ. He has saved them from themselves. He saved them from their, their circumstances. He saved them from the way they have felt entrapped by various situations in life. He sets us free. But he's saviour because we no longer have to face that punishment of sin that every sinner has to face because we've all violated the law of God. But when we recognise that Jesus has paid that penalty that he suffered on the cross not for his sins, but for mine and yours, then he becomes our saviour when we put our faith in him. So God, in raising Jesus from the dead, seating him at the right hand, God is sending a message out. He's saying, this one is, is the ruler of the kingdom, along with me, bringing in the kingdom of God, but he is the saviour you need to look to. And of course part of the proclamation in the early church was there is no other name under heaven by which men can be saved. The apostles were saying that as they were being threatened by the chief priests and uh, the uh, hierarchy there. They made it very clear that uh, there was nobody else who could save them. So here again is part, it's only a short uh, message but it's uh, something that has been declared. That God is showing that he is Prince and Saviour. Those two things are very important. We talk about it, Jesus being Saviour and Lord of our lives. I don't think I've said for a long time, but when I was a teenager, uh, when I went up to uh, uh, the uh, Lake District to uh, Keswick Convention, there was a young people's meeting, and somebody said, now, now that uh, you've received Jesus as Saviour, you should uh, say, uh, choose him as Lord. That's rubbish. You cannot separate Jesus as Saviour and Lord. You receive him as your Lord when you receive him as Saviour. You confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord. I don't know how we come to try and separate the two. 
And sometimes we need to be challenged a little bit more to make sure that he is our Lord. That's a different matter. And uh, it's always good just to examine our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So there we are. And then we come to Acts chapter 10. Uh, where it talks about uh, God has appointed him as, as judge of the living and the dead. Acts chapter 10 and verse 40. It talks about him uh, being hung on a cross there in verse 39. God raised him up on the third day and granted that he become visible, not to all the people, but to witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God. That is, to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he ordered us to preach to the people and solemnly testify that this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. Him all the prophets bear witness, and through his name everyone who believes in him receives the forgiveness of sins. So there are... A couple of things that go together there that uh, it says very clearly that uh, God has raised him from the dead on the third day, that he became visible to certain people with those eyewitnesses, 500 in all at one time, and many other individual uh, witness uh, occasions. We read of the the first one that took place that appeared uh, when Jesus appeared to Mary this morning. Later in the day, he appeared... uh, uh, to all the apostles, all the disciples, he appeared to the, those two on the Emmaus roads. He appeared uh, to Peter, it seems perhaps as an individual experience from what uh, we see there in Luke. Uh, so there were so many appearances, uh, so many visitations that, uh, from Jesus, the risen Lord. But it says here that God has made him judge of the living and the dead. We'll look at this a little bit more because it comes up again later. Obviously, there comes a point at which we do have to give an account of the living and the dead. Those who've died, every one of them will have to give an account before the Lord Jesus Christ. Unless, well, uh, let me just uh, explain it a little bit further. Those who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ will appear before Jesus to give an account of what they've done in their lives. Uh, We shall be saved. But there seems to be something of rewards that, uh, uh, where those who perhaps have been most uh, faithful uh, will have uh, responsibility in reigning with him in some way. We don't know all the details, uh, but there is obviously something there in Scripture. But those who have not believed in Jesus, in the book of Revelation it says they will appear before the great white throne. Why a white throne? Well, it speaks of purity. When Jesus judges, he judges absolutely right. But you are judged on whether your name, as again as it says in the book of Revelation, whether your name has appeared in the Lamb's book of life. And what this means is that Jesus is the sacrificial lamb, as it were. All those sacrifices in the Old Testament, even the Passover lamb and so on, are all pointing to Jesus. They are pictures of what Jesus is actually going to do. And when we put our faith in him, we have eternal life. So it's put there in the book of Revelation that your name then is put in the Lamb's book of life. You came to faith in Christ. You confessed him as Savior and Lord. You will not appear before that great white throne. Because you have already been forgiven. You're not under the sentence of condemnation. But every other person will be. And it talks here about the living and the dead. Because some will not go through death. Because when Jesus comes, we will be caught up to meet him in the air. But the, the, the dead will certainly be judged. Uh, because they will not appear then. They will not be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. But what it's saying really is that we all have to appear before him in one way or another. Some, yes, perhaps just to say what they've done with their lives as followers of Jesus, but others to be sentenced under that condemnation and to be sentenced to be separated from God for eternity. That is hell. So there it is, but it goes on to say, uh, um, of him all the prophets bear witness uh, that through his name everyone who believes in him receives the forgiveness of sins. It couldn't be clearer, could it? 
This is the message that we're proclaiming. Everyone who believes in him would uh, receive the forgiveness of sins. So it's important this morning that you understand God has actually raised him from the dead. That God has raised him and put him at the right hand of God. That uh, Jesus is seated there with the Father. And that in him is the forgiveness of sins if you put your faith in him. So have you this morning. That's pretty vital. And then we come back again to the same statement. Obviously we would expect some of the things to reoccur in these various messages. But uh, it says that he did not undergo decay. And it's taking up that same matter from uh, the book of Psalms where, where David speaks about not allowing the Holy One to see decay. So in Acts 13 and verse 34. As for that fact that he raised him up from the dead, no longer to return to, to decay. He has spoken in this way. I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore, he also says in another psalm, you will not allow your Holy One to undergo decay. For David, after he served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid among the fathers and underwent decay. But he whom God raised did not undergo decay. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through him forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And through him, everyone who believes is freed from all things from which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. Well, part of the argument is exactly the same there. It's taking that uh, promise made uh, through David or to David about the Holy One that he would not see decay. So God raised him up. Uh, but he's going on to say, therefore, you should take special note. If God has raised him up and fulfilled that promise, you should take special note that this is the Messiah. And that through him there is the forgiveness of sins. Yet something interesting here though. He says that uh, everyone who believes in him is freed from all things from which he could not be freed through the law of Moses. What it's saying is two things I think here. The law of Moses might show us the right way to live. But there wasn't always the power to do it. When we become believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, there is the power to do it. Some people misinterpret that word, you're not under law, you're under grace. And they say, we don't have to obey the law of God any longer. Uh, we can do as we like, we're under grace. No, what it's saying there in the context is, the law could not help me to live the life that I wanted to live. I saw the law was good, but I found myself doing all the wrong things. I agreed with my mind that that was right. You shall not steal. I don't know whether Paul ever did steal, but he said the law says you shall not covet. But he said I found out I did covet from some, uh, sometimes. I was agreed covetousness was, was bad. It could lead to stealing and other things. And yet I found myself doing it. But he's saying now we have come to know the grace of God and the power of God through the Holy Spirit. I'm able to overcome that. So you are set free where the law of Moses couldn't really help. And in the end, of course, the law of Moses, even if you lived as righteous a life as possible, it could not save you. Because we've all sinned at some point in our lives. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the law could not bring forgiveness of sins. It could only show you what sin was. Jesus, by dying upon that cross could bring forgiveness of sins. And God raised him up to declare he was indeed the Messiah. That's part of, again, the argument here. So the need to believe. And then coming back to this matter about uh, appointed as judge, Acts chapter 17. Another message of the Apostle Paul, uh, who I think it's at um, Mars Hill in Athens, yes it is, uh, where he preached very close to the uh, um, Acropolis, where all the pagan gods were. And of course, when Paul had been going around, he saw uh, one altar set up, just in case they missed one god. And it was inscribed to the unknown god. And Paul said, I I'm declaring him. He wasn't going to talk about any of the gods uh, uh, of Rome, because they were, they were not gods at all. 
that were actually demonic powers. So he wasn't going to build on that foundation. He said, I'll build on the one that you don't know about. The one true God who made all things. But then he goes on to say in verse uh, 30 of Acts 17. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance. You know, you're ignorant about this God. But I'm telling you now who the one true God is. God is now declaring to uh, to men that all people everywhere should repent. Because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Well, some sneered at that, but uh, others said we will hear more of this again. Always been some who sneered at the resurrection. But the fact is that God has raised him up, and that God is saying, I've raised him up, he will judge, I'm commanding all men everywhere to repent. If you want to escape the judgment, you need to repent and come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's very clearly the message. But it's tied in with the resurrection. If Jesus remained in that grave, he would not be the judge in the future. But he's alive to judge every person. Again, the message is very plain. Repent. And then the last uh, thing I found, and of course uh, much of the rest of the Acts of the Apostles is all about Paul's arrest and him being in prison, so we don't have any, too many messages coming through, too many sermons, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but here he's before uh, King Agrippa, and once more he takes the opportunity just to tell it how it is. So he said, uh, I'll read from verse uh, 22 I think so having obtained help from God I stand to this day testifying both to small and great stating nothing but what the prophets of Moses said was going to take place that the Christ was to suffer and that by reason of his resurrection from the dead he would be the first to proclaim light both to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles proclaim light what's that really saying well back in Isaiah talked about uh, one who was to come who would be a light to the Gentiles. You see, what it's really saying is that we're all groping around in darkness till we know the truth. And there may be all sorts of religions that proclaim to give illumination, but really they're only darkness. The one who really shows it as it is, the one who dispels the darkness. We talk about people being in the dark. When we say that, we mean that they don't know what's going to happen. We are not in that position because God has made it very plain through Jesus and all the signs and wonders he did, the sort of things that he said, the other things taken up by the apostles, what had already been prepared by the uh, prophets. But that was only showing the way, really. The true light came when Jesus came into the world. In fact, Scripture talks about him being the light of the world. In the tabernacle, there was a candelabra, seven... uh, Uh, seven-pronged candelabra, uh, speaking of perfection. But that's only pointing to Jesus who would come into the world as the light of the world. So that again, he shows the way to God. Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father except by him. Actually, I think that matter of coming to the Father isn't just coming to a knowledge of the Father. It's actually to come to the Father for eternal life, that's the context. Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us. You cannot come to heaven except by Jesus. Jesus is the one who shows the way. Shows particularly as he dies on the cross. As he suffers in your place and mine. As he knows that awful separation from God that you needn't know in the future. That you can truly come to the Father. And it's not just for the Jews, it's for the Gentiles, he says. So isn't this good news? And isn't it something we really need to take on board? If I can just summarize, because I think it's important just to recap. There's something about the person of Jesus in the resurrection. That he's Lord and Messiah. As we saw too in Romans, uh, that passage that Bell was referring to. He's declared Son of God. Uh, by the resurrection. So he is an extremely important person. He is God himself, basically. He's Lord and Messiah. He reigns on high. 
He was raised up to reign on high with the Father. We might add he's there to make intercession for us too. To say, Father, you know I went through the cross so that they could be saved. And now they're responding in faith. Will you receive them? And the Father says, of course, gladly. Isn't that the plan we had? That you would go to the cross to bring salvation. Gladly I will save them. If we can dare put an argument like that. But uh, that's something of how we understand that he ever lives to make intercession. It's on the basis of what he's done that you are saved. Prince or ruler and saviour. Again, comes to bring in the kingdom of God, the reign of God. But it comes to save you from your sin. We've seen very clearly that in the resurrection there is the, the fulfilment of prophecy there. That he was not allowed to see decay. That he would sit at God's right hand. He's raised from the dead, didn't see decay, he's seated at God's right hand now. Just as the word said he would. And then the whole importance of his ministry, we know that one day he will judge all. And you have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Either, as it were, to be commended that you came to faith, and to say, well, well done, good and faithful servant. I hope that will be the case, as we've sought to be faithful to the Lord. Or to be separated from the presence of God. Where there is gnashing of teeth in that outer darkness as Jesus puts it in the parable. He came to bring light and salvation. If Jesus is so important and incidentally it is through repentance and faith. We've seen that as we've been going through. If Jesus is so important and the resurrection is so crucial. That Jesus might be seen as Lord and Messiah might be judged in the future might equally be the one who intercedes on your behalf as an advocate, as it were, before the Father, saying they have received what I did at Calvary. If he is so important and his work and ministry is so important, isn't it about time you actually committed your life to the Lord this morning and received him as Saviour and Lord? And if you've already done so, how much more we should rejoice in that resurrection, and perhaps put more emphasis upon the resurrection in our witnessing to Jesus. I mean, if this is a unique event, 500 testified to the fact he was alive. If this is such a unique event, then surely there is something pretty powerful that took place on that third day. And of course, he is Saviour and Lord. Let's make sure that he truly is Lord of our lives. But you may need to make sure he's Saviour and Lord. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you this morning for this record in the Acts of the Apostles. But Lord, we have to say there's so much more that could have been added. Lord, I for one uh, felt somewhat uh, rebuked that I don't make more of the resurrection in my preaching. Lord, help me to do so in the future. But Lord, we want to thank you that this morning that we're uh, rejoicing that Jesus is alive forevermore and seated at your right hand. And Lord, we would, I would ask that there will be no one here who will appear for judgment before that great white throne. But all will have their names written in the Lamb's book of life. Lord, we, I would pray that your spirit this morning will work in anyone who has not yet come to that place. But for us, Lord, all of us who do believe, we thank you again that he is our Lord and Savior. And we rejoice that he's alive forevermore. Thank you, too, that we can know something of that power of the resurrection in our own lives. The power of the Holy Spirit. Praise your name. Amen.